Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 180th video cast, 170th podcast for the week ending March 30th, 2023. Uh, we're going to go through some pictures. It's been a busy couple of weeks. Uh, first, we were in Orlando, Florida for Age Group Nationals. Their short course swim season is ending, so there are a lot of meets all at once. I'm coming to you from Webster, New York, which I think is a few minutes from Rochester and from Canada uh right now for zones championships but uh and uh here we are in an airbnb so if you hear kids uh half the swim team is in the house uh, uh, uh playing with our girls uh before they swim this afternoon but uh so this was at animal kingdom i know some of you like the uh like the photos this was the girls at the meet last week in orlando uh this was yeah mimi and annabelle this is Mimi, just crushed it uh, up on the podium. Uh, this is Annabelle. Mimi, I don't know why all these uh, athletes like to bite their medals, but it is what it is. Uh, that was actually from the week before in uh, Connecticut for the state championships. This is Disney with um, Daphne Duck or um, I, I don't know. You, you guys will know better than I do. This was a golf lesson I took with Andy Plummer down in Miami. I uh, was able to go down one day. They didn't swim and uh, do a full day lesson. He literally wrote the book on stack and tilt swing. It's a famous red book with uh, Mike Bennett. And uh, I, I don't understand all this stuff that he laid out, but I can tell you one thing. I'm hitting the ball better and I'm back to hitting a push draw, uh, which, is, which is a very positive thing. So uh, very excited there. Uh, this was... Oh, so I asked my wife to write up a quick summary on what they did because I said last week we would do that. Mimi and Annabelle crushed it at age group nationals. They went head-to-head -head with the fastest 10-year-olds in the country. Mimi brought home five medals and Annabelle, Annabelle brought home four. Both girls had numerous PBs. That's personal best times. Mimi went 215 in the 200 freestyle making the podium. That was the podium picture we showed. And Annabelle went 111 in the 100 backstroke and 238 in the 200 IM. She's finishing out her short course season number one in the nation for her age in backstroke and number two in the individual medley. So it was a good week and well worthwhile. Uh, nowadays, you can rent these Airbnbs and uh, it's like, you know, you get get uh, nothing changes in terms of getting your work done, which is awesome. Uh, moving right along on March 2nd. We talked about Alibaba with Charles Payne and said it was the last chance to buy under $100. So we're going to play that for you right now. Can't let you go without asking about Alibaba in, in a Chinese market. Yeah. A lot of false starts there. Uh, is, is, it, is the dust cleared? I mean, can, can it, an, an investor go in there now and make some money? Look, we've been buying Alibaba for months. This is going to be the last time you're going to have a chance to buy this thing under $100. You saw the composite PMIs yesterday completely off the charts. And I think what people are underestimating in terms of the global recovery is China's going to crush the 5% GDP. Rising tide lifts all boats. You can buy Alibaba at 2014 prices. You know what the only difference is, Charles? They've grown revenue by 800%. They've grown earnings and cash flow by 500%. This thing is going to take off and people are going to chase. What we need is a little weakness in the dollar, too. Uh, President Xi, though, no more, uh, he won't attack the, these big tech names, Chinese tech names anymore? Well, I think when he saw the people rioting in the streets, he figured out, wait, people want economic prosperity. We got to let we gotta let this thing go. Yeah, run. he should have learned a lesson. When you take someone off a bicycle and put them in a car, <laughs> they'll fight you tooth and nail to go never back. go back to a bicycle, by the way, except in New York City. This is the first First time ever that they're going to do their recovery, their stimulus is all going to be consumption-based versus infrastructure-based. Remember, they built those yeah, empty the cities, cities, the bridges, yeah. the whole thing. It's all going into consumption, and Alibaba is the toll taker. If you're buying something in China, you're probably going through Alibaba or one of the others, but Alibaba's got the biggest share. That thing's going to work, and that cloud business is just getting started with the digitization. So I know it's down and out. I know no one loves it, but I'll be back maybe in 12 months, and we'll talk about it, and we'll say, We'll try to get was, you back soon. Great yeah. stuff, Tom. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. All right, folks. And we're back. I want to thank uh, Liz Clayman, uh, Jake Mack, and Catherine Myers for having me on Fox Business on Friday. We talked about uh, a new pick, PayPal. We also talked about the banking crisis. So you definitely want to listen to that one. Uh, you can click on it in the article of the week. Thanks to all of them for having me on. Also, uh, Tuesdays when all the action happened because Baba announced it's a uh, new change where they're going to restructure the company into six divisions, which will enable each individual uh, division to have their own accountability. 
and he'll either be spun to shareholders or IPO. This is monstrous. This is going to unlock the value, some of the parts. Um, but rather than repeat it, I want to play uh, exactly what I talked to with my friend, Rochelle Akufo. Uh, and I want to thank Rochelle and I want to thank Pamela Granda for having me on, as well as Connor, the other producer that uh, greeted me and uh, walked me back to the green room. Uh, really enjoyed. So let's take a listen here so you can get number one. Uh, update on Alibaba since the announcement. Number two, update on biotech. Some of you have been asking about that. And number three, uh, overall general market outlook and some surprises in here. So here we go. Alibaba announced that it will split into six separate units, its biggest restructuring of its 24-year history. Now, this comes as the current Alibaba CEO, Jack Ma, suddenly resurfaced in China after a year-long absence. For more on this, let's welcome in Thomas Hayes, Great Hill Capital Chairman and Managing Member. Good to have you, Thomas. So, a little bit unexpected. I mean, Jack Ma just now resurfaced in China and now seeing, seeing this split into six units, each will have its own CEO, its own board, potential for IPOs. What are your big takeaways from this move? This is an historic day for Alibaba, and it's been a long time coming. This is, this is a mechanism to unlock value for shareholders who have been patiently waiting for months and months and months, I know, as a major shareholder. And uh, this is just huge. So if you look at the six parts, Rochelle, just, just take the Ali Cloud business, the Ali Yun business, okay? This business did $11 billion of revenues last year. McKinsey expects that the cloud business as an industry will triple by 2025. So let's put it at 30, 35. They currently have 38% share of the entire market in China right now. Mm -hmm. So at 30 billion, the operating margins will expand to probably about AWS range, mid to high 20s. So you're looking at 10, 11 billion dollars of operating income with a fast growing business. They're going to throw the AI business into the cloud business. So then you apply a normalized 20 times, 25 times multiple. You've got a 200 billion dollar business just in one out of those six pieces. That's the type of value unlock that we're going to see, whether they IPO, whether they spin. It's just a monster thing. Oh, and by the way, you get Tmall, Taobao, Lazada. You get uh, the logistics business. You get the Ellie Mae business. You get the international uh, e-commerce business. So I think this is just going to be a monster. And every single value investor like myself, we looked at it on a piece-by-piece -piece basis. And we said the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. Now the sum of the parts is going to be realized. And if you look, yesterday alone, the business closed at $220 billion valuation. Just that one piece can be worth a lot more. So then is there still an appetite then to jump in here, knowing that Chinese regulators will still be keeping an eye on what happens with Alibaba? Well, that's, that's another key reason. So as this huge conglomerate, they were kind of the whipping boy for the, uh, you know, the entire platform economy. So when the, when the regulators were cracking down, and they've eased up a bit, but now with six individual parts, they can kind of fly under the radar and become large businesses unto themselves, but not be this massive business that, that controls so much of the economy and is uh, so much of a toll taker in China. So I think this is a good, good uh, decision from an economic standpoint for shareholders. It's a good decision from a regulatory standpoint. Shareholders are going to love this. It's going to take time to realize the value, but we're off to a good start today. But I think just beginning. All right. Well, let's also take a look at the value that we're seeing in the market sentiment in U.S. markets today. I mean, some bearishness. We're seeing this sort of mixed picture, the sort of tentativeness at the moment. What level of bearishness are we at? And is it justified? <laughs> we're at some serious pessimism. I, one of the things that I look at, Rochelle, is the Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey. And, and this uh, lays it out. Invest, uh, investment managers are more bearish than they were during the great financial crisis lows. They're more bearish than they were during the euro debt crisis lows in 2011. I know you're too young for that stuff, uh, but, but I was hard. around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the pandemic lows. Can you imagine people are more bearish today than the pandemic lows when we didn't know if we would have a vaccine or when we'd have a vaccine? And that's where we are. Now, the recession fears, they've come off the peak a little bit, which implies that that's happened. Uh, that happened in April of 2020 after the bottom was in. That happened in March of 2009 after the bottom was in. So we're, our base case is that the October lows are solid. They're in. Uh, we have some short-term volatility. But markets don't top. Right now, managers are overweight bonds and cash, and they're right. underweight U.S. equities and tech. Markets don't 
top when everyone is overweight bonds and cash. They top when everyone's overweight stocks and overweight stocks in a leveraged way so that there are no marginal buyers. So we're nowhere near those levels and that's why we, re we uh, remain very constructive on the markets. So then in terms of the sectors that you like, I know one of your themes is healthcare. Break that down for us. What do you see? Yeah, so the Fed is basically done, uh, even if they don't know it, or maybe one more hike if they really want to get aggressive. Uh, but in that environment where, where uh, growth is uh, moderating a little bit below trend, uh, no, no more hikes, rates are going to start to come down. Certainly you're seeing it in the 10-year yield. Uh, that's a good environment for healthcare. And we like biotech. We like a basket of biotech. Uh, XBI ETF, and this reminds us a lot of the tightening cycle from 2015 to 2018. Mm. That ETF collapsed 51% uh, because of the tightening cycle from 2015 to 2016, and then subsequently rallied as the tightening cycle worked its way through and started to end. It rebounded 135% over the next 24 months. Now, the XBI ETF from 2021 to 2022 collapsed 65%. It bottomed in May. It's been grinding sideways for about six months. It just did a little retest to shake everyone out. Uh, we think this is going to be constructive, and we also think we can see triple-digit gains now that the tightening cycle is ending uh, over the next 12 to 24 months. So we think there's a lot of opportunity there, and the key drivers, Rochelle, are going to be drugs and deals, okay? Uh, <laughs> that doesn't, uh, that doesn't, that, sound, that, great, that doesn't yeah. sound great. So <laughs> the drug approvals are coming in fast and furious, Alzheimer's cancer, because uh, the focus is off of COVID at the FDA and back, back onto drugs and deals. Big Pharma's got $500 billion of cash on their balance sheet, up 400% over the last 20 years. They're coming uh, up to patent cliffs, so they're going to have to buy growth. They're going to have to buy innovation, and these deals are going to happen. It, you know, Pfizer just bought CGen for $43 billion. As you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We're going to see a lot more deals. We're going to see a lot more fear of loss amongst board of directors. That's going to drive the group, and it's going to be very constructive. Historically, the valuations are so low. Just to get back to the average multiple from the past two decades, price to book, the sector would have to go up 25%. Price to operating cash flow would have to go up over 155% and price to forward PE up 110%. So that's in line with our expectations for the next 12 to 24 months. So certainly plays to be made here, not just yeah. staying defensive, certainly some options on the table. That's right. Always good to see you. Thomas Hayes there, Great Hill Capital Chairman and Managing Member. Thank you for your time this morning. Thanks for having me. All right, checking. And we're back. Uh, so thanks to them. And then on the same day, uh, literally just coming in from Orlando, I uh, went down to the New York Stock Exchange to talk to Kristen Scholler. want to thank Ali Thompson for having me on, Joe Cole, uh, Chris, the producer, who got all the great shots in the background. I'll show you in just a little bit. Uh, and we're going to play this one also because it covers, again, it was happening in real time as Alibaba made the announcement. And a lot of you have questions about how this value will be unlocked and what the fair value of the company could be. So we're going to listen here. Joining me now is Thomas Hayes, founder and chair of Great Hill Capital. Uh, Thomas, great to have you on the show. Down here from the floor of the Stock Exchange, thank you. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. All right, let's start with this Alibaba news today. The stock up wildly in a sea of mostly red, fat fractional losses for the major indexes. There's a, a look at the intraday chart. What does this mean for this stock and perhaps the sector? Yeah, this is an historic day for Alibaba. We've been waiting for this value. Investors like me have always had the thesis, some of the parts is greater than the whole. If you look at the six parts, just take a look at Alien, which is the Ali Cloud business, the equivalent of AWS in the US. Uh, this business alone did $11 billion of revenue last year. McKinsey expects the cloud industry to grow three times, to triple by 2025. Uh, Amazon, uh, the Ali Cloud has 38% share. That means they'll be doing $30 billion a year in revenue. Op or operating margins will expand to the mid to high 20s, which means $10 billion of operating income. Now, as a standalone, that will be able to command a higher multiple than within the larger company, whether it's spun out to shareholders or IPO. You put a 10 to 20, uh, more like a 20 to 25 times multiple on a fast growing business, you have a 200 to $250 billion business. That's just one division. You get the other five divisions for free. Yesterday, the entire business closed at $220 billion. So it gives you an idea of the value lock over the next 12 to 24 months. This is a big deal, and it shows discrete opportunities in a bearish take. And, and it is interesting, right? A Chinese company uh, executing this. Do you expect this in this current environment from U.S. companies? Yeah, I don't think it's going to be immediately in the U.S. companies. You are going to see a lot of spinoffs in the U.S. companies. You're seeing it in 
3M, you're seeing it in Baxter, you're seeing it in some of the established uh, blue chip companies in the U.S., uh, but as far as breaking up companies, et cetera, like you're seeing, this is a Chinese story. Particularly, you may start to see it with Tencent, you may start to see it with other companies in emerging markets. Interesting. Uh, now let's talk about the state of the overall market. Of course, we were hearing um, the testimony on Capitol Hill today about these banking collapses two weeks ago. Seems like there is still some concern, lingering concern out there in the market. What do you see as the path forward for stocks? Yeah, well, you saw First Republic down and Pacific uh, West Bank Corp today down both about 5%. This is not fully over. We're going to have some bump, bumps and hiccups along the way because it's not just one mismanaged bond portfolio. The issue is the genie's out of the bottle, and there's going to have to be some type of temporary backstop on deposits or some increase in FDIC insurance, which the executive branch can do unilaterally in times of crisis. They don't have to wait for it to go through Congress. So I think you're going to see more bumps like that. But we are constructive on the market because if you look at the Bank of America Fund Manager Survey, which came out just a few days ago, Managers are more pessimistic than they were at the 2009 lows of great financial crisis. Wow. I know you're too young for that. Oh, I remember <laughs> that. I wasn't doubting it, but I do remember that. Uh, and more bearish than the euro debt crisis and more bearish than the pandemic lows before wow. we even had a vaccination. Wow. So you have that. You, you have uh, recession fears have come off a little bit which implies historically when that happens that the bottom's already in. And we're of that camp that the October lows sure. are the bottom because the market bottom six to nine months before earnings bottom. So even if you're a little more pessimistic on earnings coming down a little bit, uh, we think that's a pretty solid bottom there in October, and we think there are things to do, opportunities. Okay, so let's, I guess, talk about some of these opportunities. Uh, I guess we can talk indices, sectors, and then maybe get into some individual picks in this current environment. Yeah. So the, the Fed uh, has zero to one more hikes, and historically what we see is that uh, six months out after the Fed pauses, you're up 13 plus percent. 12 months out, you're up 18%. This is since 1984. And 24 months out, you're up over 30%. No one's positioned for that. Now, in a slower growing environment, kind of below trend here because of all the tightening, uh, what works? And we like healthcare as our theme, and we particularly like biotech. This reminds us of the tightening cycle from 2015 to, to 2018. Biotech, the uh, ETF XBI, it dropped 51% in anticipation of the tightening cycle. It rebounded 131% over the next, 135% over the next 24 months. Uh, this time around, 2021 to 2022, in anticipation of the tightening, dropped 65%. We expect it to rebound at least 100% over the next 12 to 24 months. It's a lot of opportunity there. Multiples are below historic averages. To get just back to the average, and we always overshoot on the upside, just like we're overshooting on the downside. Get back to the average uh, book value, it, the sector has to go up 25%. Price to operating cash flow up 150% from here, and forward PE up over 110%. So there's a lot to do. The, the themes are deals and drugs. You saw Pfizer buy CGen, just the tip of the iceberg at 43 billion. We're gonna see a lot more because Big Pharma's got half a trillion dollars of cash and they've got to buy the innovation now that they've got the patent clips. So does that insinuate that, that growth names will outperform? I mean, you look at the major indexes, the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ, I think people are trying to kind of discern where we move from here. Yeah, we're, we're kind of in an information vacuum two weeks ahead of earnings, so everyone's, but we do think with rates coming down and you're seeing the 10-year yield, we think there's going to be a persistence with tech. You know, they're kind of the worst performers, tech, communication Certainly. service, they're outperforming this year. We think that's going to persist. They've moved a lot, so they have to kind of digest, we're seeing in the last day or so. Uh, I think they'll digest, but I think the, the trend is going to persist. I mean, when you've got an Amazon down 55%, that's a high quality business. Uh, even Alphabet, some of these bigger tech companies are going to be opportunities moving forward, in addition to the healthcare names that we've discussed. I wish we had more time, yeah, Thomas. It's always, <laughs> always good to get your take down here on the floor of the Stock Exchange. Thomas will be back soon, of course. Thomas Hayes, chair of Great Hill Capital. Thanks. Thanks so much. Okay, let's take a look. And we're back. So thanks for that. And then I want to thank um, Jack Denton for having me in his article, front page article on Barron's regarding the changes in Alibaba. This was ph phenomenal. My quote was, this is very positive for shareholders. This will enable some of the parts valuation to be realized more quickly as faster growing business segments will ultimately be awarded much higher multiples by the market when IPO'd or spun to shareholders. I also said six smaller pieces will fly under the radar versus one behemoth as a constant target when it relates to regulatory pressures. You definitely want to read Jack's article and all of Jack's articles, by the way. I've referenced him many times on the podcast uh, and uh, grateful to be a part of that. 
Also want to thank Yurvac, Yurvaj Malik, Selena Lee, Eduardo Baptista, Johan Cherian, Scott Murdoch, Sajwat Chulan, Josh Yi, Kane Wu, Tom Westerbrook, Ash Schumann Daga for including me in their Reuters article about the same subject. They quoted a bunch of analysts and, uh, and they um, uh, quoted us on the Alibaba. This was an important, you can tell by the number of authors, this was a very uh, high read and trafficked article for that day. Also want to thank Manya Saini for including me in her article uh, earlier in the week on Block. So this was the key news. Ali, but this this started all the action. Um, Alibaba recognize, reorganizes to unlock value. By the way, I want to thank my friends Adam and Rick. You know who you are for sending me the, the important research uh, that I need to make this call great on a monthly and, and in some cases weekly basis. Uh, it's very, very helpful stuff. Uh, Alibaba reorganizes to unlock value. Uh, we're, we'll get into this in just a little bit in more detail. Alibaba stock soars, unprecedented shakeup could unlock major value. This is the Jack Denton article. This tells you everything you need to know over at Barron's. Check it out. And then this is uh, from uh, Brendan Ahern over at the KWeb ETF talking about Premier Lee's improving economic outlook and PetroChina's extraordinary results. And he talks about Premier Lee's keynote speech at the Bao Forum stated, quote, in the first two months of the year, the Chinese economy showed an encouraging momentum of rebound. The situation in March is, quote, even better than that in January and February, February, the government will build on the momentum of recovery and work for sustained and overall improvement in the economic performance. So that was very positive. Moving along, you see Alibaba uh, CEO sees group evolving as asset and capital operator. Basically, they're copying the Berkshire Hathaway model uh, with independent business units, independent accountability. And uh, as it splits into six independent entities, so that was positive. China's Premier Li Kang seeks to rally Asia behind Beijing, claim that China has acted responsibly in its role as a big country, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you can go into some more detail about that, but they are going out now trying to uh, woo back investors. And I think based on the growth that they're seeing and going to continue to see that the investors will be back sooner than everyone expects. Uh, after a more than $1 trillion route, Beijing appears to be warming to Chinese tech giants. They finally figured out that they desperately need them for jobs and growth and stability. And, uh, and so they don't have people rioting in the streets. So Alibaba's major reorganization is viewed as a sign that the Chinese government could be relaxing its intense scrutiny of the domestic technology sector. Everything we've been waiting for that we said would ultimately the value would be unlocked. This was a major catalyst. Uh, and, uh, and now we're going to see it in six different parts. Alibaba, the founder of Jack, uh, Jack Ma, returned to public engagements. Also, obviously, with the blessing of the government. Another welcome sign for investors. China is looking to achieve 5% growth this year, following two years during which the economy was battered by Beijing's strict COVID policies and regulatory tightening. So more good news. All the things that we were anticipating finally have come to pass, and now the game is just getting started. Uh, this was a great article from John Auteurs. Uh, I'll go up to the title here in just a second. It was a, a breaking up for Alibaba and a playlist plus uh, CRE. That's John Auteurs over at um, Bloomberg. And usually has a bear, bearish bias in his writing, but uh, always puts out good data. Um, tectonic shifts seem to be underway in China after Alibaba Group announced that they would break up its roughly $220 billion empire into six units. News sent shares up, instant 13% rally. It's since followed through the last two days. Um, the key to the changes, the biggest overhaul in the company's 24-year history, is the fact that the offspring can individually raise funds and explore their own initial public offerings. Not only will this new plan boost a lackluster capital market sector that has seen public debuts, debuts dwindle since the pandemic, it will also serve two goals. Appeasing Chinese regulators who have ramped up their crackdown against, quote, too big to fail tech firms and unlocking more value for the firm that is traded at a much cheaper valuation than its rivals. For instance, Alibaba's forward earnings multiple rates 
the stock cheaper than CLP Holdings Limited, a utility company, or just on par with China Telecom. So it's trading with multiples of a utility or a telecom, which is mind boggling. Uh, imagine if Amazon traded at the same multiple as uh, um, Con Edison. I mean, it's, it's a joke. So for a company of Alibaba scale, competitive position and growth potential should be uh, this should be absurd. So he lays out here, you can see the multiples come down from 27 times to nine times uh, while earnings are going up at the exact same time. So the big announcement came after regulators vowed to boost support for private firms after years of scrutiny that has left inv investors bruised and put a lashing, lasting dent in market sentiment towards China and its corporate governments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can read the whole article, but this is the key here. And this is what we've been talking about. Eventually, you know, it's Mr. Market, the manic depressive. It overshoots in euphoria on the up, upside and despondency on the downside. This is a despondent multiple, and now it's going to be broken up, and you're going to start to see some units are going to get 30 and 40 times multiple. The fast-growing units and some units are going to get 10 or 15 times multiple, but the sum of the parts is going to be a lot greater than whole, as you heard me talking with Rochelle and uh, Kristen in the earlier segments. Alibaba may be splitting up but it will probably keep the good parts for itself. So Jack does a follow-on article, Jack Denton over at Barron's, um, about Taobao and Tmall, which by the way, we got in for the cloud business. Taobao and Tmall is currently the most profitable um, uh, segment and the highest valued. So if you think that, if you agree with my analysis that the cloud can be worth what the entire business was before this announcement in the next couple of years, and then you've got, Tmall and Taobao, which is more valuable than that. Plus, you've got four other divisions on top of it. Remember the Costco of China, uh, Ellie Mae, which, by the way, the logistics business, Kainau, is uh, IPOing at a valuation of $20 billion already. That's not even in our thesis, uh, never mind Ant Financial, et cetera. So Alibaba's, this was announced today, $20 billion logistic arm gears up for a Hong Kong IPO. Um, City and CICC are, are the, the uh, book runners. Listing could happen as, as, soon, as soon as the end of 2023. And this is the logistic arm. Uh, let's just see here. And they're looking at a $20 billion valuation on that piece alone, which no one ever gives any credit to when they do the analysis, which is mind boggling. Uh, Tencent turns to growth, expects AI to be a major boost. They also got uh, I actually have another article. JD shares uh, soar on plan to list two units in Hong Kong. I'm telling you, the flows back now with the dollar weakening into China are going to start to accelerate and gallop uh, right before our eyes. The game is back on. Everyone knows it. Tencent, NetEase win new Chinese video game licenses. Remember that crackdown started with video game licenses and education. Well, now they just got 86 approvals from Beijing. So that's all you need to know. China's central government is borrowing at fastest pace on record, which is code for stimulating and, uh, and regrowing the economy, which is going to be consumption-led versus uh, industrial-led, as it has been historically. China and uh, Alibaba is the toll taker. China's big banks sees profit gains. And here, I love this part of the headline, despite slowing economy. Well, that's not the facts, as you heard the premier talk about uh, in January and February were mind boggling and March was even better. So that's all you need to know. And in that context, the banks are now even profitable. Net income was up 7.1% for CCB, 5.2% for BOCOM, 7.4% uh, for AgBank and 5% for BOC and 3.5% for ICBC. This was in the fourth quarter when the entire country was shut down. Wait till we see the first quarter numbers, ladies and gentlemen. Moving right along, Intel, one of the stocks we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, new position, exciting. Uh, surges, analysts said new chips to be ready sooner. I listened to their uh, whole webcast yesterday, but the summary is all you really need to know from Susquehanna. Said some next generation data center chips will be ready sooner than expected. In a note, it says Intel hitting its or even pulling in its stated roadmaps was a major improvement. Um, and that's that. We also saw from Micron, which was the big thing, I think, the catalyst, which we've been talking about as part of our thesis, was that, uh, you know, you had all the pull forward in 2020 and 2021 for computers and phones. 
uh, big inventory build. And we, we said that that was peaking. Well, that's what Micron said. And even though they reported poor earnings, the stock rallied because uh, the executive said that inventory issues have peaked. And that's the name of the game when you have you know, Intel controls 70% of some of the businesses that they're in. So all you need to know is inventories have peaked and the game is back on the operating leverage. And then you've got this whole whipped cream that everyone is basing their pessimism on, whether they can execute on this grandiose plan to build advanced chips. Forget about advanced chips. You'll get the advanced chips. But all you need to know is inventories have peaked for PC and um uh, the digital farms, the uh, the server comp, the the cloud and the server business, uh, and that's enough to just that that alone is enough to double the stock over the next couple of years. And then if you get if Gelsinger delivers on his grandiose plans, which I think he can actually, if there was anyone that can do it, he's the guy. Uh, then you've got way more than a double, and uh, and we're pretty excited about that. Janet Yellen says bank deregulation may have gone too far. Uh, so, you know, basically they're trying to say this was one risk manager and uh, had nothing to do with us. It had nothing to do with the fact that, you know, we we had the steepest hiking in the history, you know, in the history of the country. Uh, 500 basis points from base from zero in 12 months in terms of percentage on percentage. It's mind boggling. But um, uh, they they've provided unlimited liquidity. But. I don't think this is completely over uh, in the sense that the deposits are still flowing to the bigger banks from the regionals. And until they increase that backstop, uh, we, we are not investors in, um, in regional banks. We bought Bank of America, as we shared last week, um, uh, because they're going to be a beneficiary of the uh, ineptness of, of the way this is being handled. Um, uh, there will be an opportunity for regional banks. For those of you who want to take a couple punts and gambles, that's fine. But I think that the systemically important banks came down enough that why would you even take the risk with the regionals? I, you know, I went through like 40 regionals last night and I'm just like, you know, the major banks came down basically just as much. Why would I ever take that risk? There's, there's no reason to. I think Bank of America is the play just to have some exposure to the, to the dislocation, which is what we love to do. Uh, Fed balance sheet uh, went up another 100 billion, so that's 400 billion in two weeks uh, because of the uh, uh, basic um, inability to wait for the tightening to work through the system, and that's going to be that extra 25 basis points, or maybe another 25 basis points is going to be another trillion dollar expansion. So at the end of this tightening cycle, you'll be at five percent. You'll be at a record balance sheet size when, if they'd done it right. It could have been at 3.5% and the balance, they could have drained liquidity through the balance sheet uh, and they could have had the balance sheet down to 6 trillion or 7 trillion uh, and had many more bullets for the next crisis. But they did what they did and, uh, and we're basically at the end of it. So that's a good thing. And one, one anecdote here is from Spain, from my buddy Rick, uh, shared this with me today. Their inflation fell from 6% last month to 3.3% this month. Uh, and I think we're going to start to see more of these, as we've been saying, uh, when the rents, the lagged effect of the uh, year on year leases kick in May, June, July, uh, you're going to see these type of drops in the United States. It's going to be big. It's going to be surprising. And it's going to be before the next Fed meeting, which is the most important part. So for everyone that says that their deposits are fine, they're not. They're going out of the small banks. They're going into the big banks. That's all you need to know. And that's not going to change until they do some type of uh, temporary backstop or FDIC insurance uh, increase, uh, and um, you know that's uh, that's where we stand on that. Moving right along to the "Don't Stop Believing" stock market and sentiment results article of the week. Here we go. This is Jack Ma with his thumb up, returning back to China mainland this week before the announcement. Um, you know, this is a little history of the song. It's the second single from Journey's seventh uh, studio album released in 1981. The album was called Escape, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the core of the track comes from Kane, who's the keyboardist, and the words originated from a conversation he had with his dad. At the start of his career in the 1970s, uh, he was struggling uh, to, you know, to make ends meet in California when his dog was hit by a car unsure about his future in the, mu uh, in the music business. Uh, and in Hollywood, he called his dad. He needed $900 for his dog's vet bill. 
and uh, and alone, and asked his father if his music uh, if his music career was merely dreaming, and whether he should go back home to Chicago. His dad told him that he'd give him the loan, but to stay right there in Hollywood. And he said, "Son, don't stop believing. The rest is history." And they made history, and it's just. It's mind boggling. And that's a good story for every single one of you out there, uh, regardless of what you're ever pursuing is just stay tight, you know, suck it up through the, the bumpy times and the good times come in, in inevitably and, uh, and in a major way. So uh, while investing in Alibaba has felt like taking the midnight train going anywhere, uh, the exact opposite is true. Since the moment we put the first dollar to work in this asset, we knew that the sum of the parts valuation was multiples of the whole. Every negative headline and exogenous event simply created the opportunity for us to increase our ownership percentage in the business and for management to buy shares in or to buy back shares to increase our ownership in the business. Every time they buy back shares, our percentage of ownership goes up. Nothing has changed about the underlying business. And if anything, prospects have grown a lot brighter. We never stop believing. And by the way, management in the context of this new announcement announced that they remain committed to their massive buyback, which is another benefit we're going to see going forward. Besides the multiple expansion, besides the value unlock with the six different divisions, the IPOs, the spins, etc. On Tuesday, management made our life a little easier by beginning the process to unlock value for owners on an accelerated pace when they announced this. Uh, Alibaba Group will reorganize to six business groups and other investments, a move designed to, quote, unlock share shareholder value and foster market competitiveness. This, the move marks the most significant government's overhaul in the platform's uh, company's 24-year history and positions Alibaba's businesses to capture market opportunities and further stimulate growth. Uh, yesterday, I listened to the call with investors. It was at 8 this morning in Hong Kong, 8 last night here. And they said, besides the accountability and the individual board of directors, we want uh, these businesses to become more agile, more competitive, more entrepreneurial, more accountable. We want managers to have ownership in their businesses so they're incentivized to drive fast growth and not part of the kind of this, uh, this is now my editorialization, this socialism where the good units finance the bad units, but the, the bad units get a higher multiple than they're entitled to and the good units get a much lower multiple than they're entitled to, and it brings the good down, and it brings the bad up, and the net effect is a utility-style multiple when it should have a high growth multiple for some of these massive units like the cloud uh, and others. So we're going to start to see that. The six units will be Cloud Intelligence Group, which includes AI. You can imagine the multiple that thing is going to start to receive. I think this thing, once, once the game comes back on, could be at 40, 50 times. Uh, certainly, it'll probably be, I think, you know, initially three to five times sales, and then it'll expand once the game gets going and, and uh, rates continue to come down and the dollar continues to weaken. That'll be back at the normal game on multiple for the for these type of businesses of 10 times sales. And those sales are going to expand from 10 to 30 billion, as we covered with Kristen and Rochelle. And, uh, and you can do the math on that. That's a $300 billion business. And by the way, you get the five other units for free <laughs> with the T-Bow and T-Mall being orders of multiple uh, magnitude more valuable, which is pretty exciting at the moment. Uh, then you got the T-Bow, T-Mall Commerce Group, Local Services Group, the Kynow Smart Logistics, which is going public for 20 billion, uh, the Global Digital Commerce Group, the and the uh, which is uh, growing extremely fast. That has a huge uh, Lazada, etc. Um, um, what's the other one called? Uh, AliExpress and others. Digital Media and Entertainment Group. Zhang is going to stay with um, at the holding company and also the Cloud Intelligence Group. So you know. You know, it's just like Larry Culp at GE. They always stay with the most valuable uh, parts of the business. Culp stayed with aviation. He understands the runway, no pun, in, well, pun intended, uh, for that business over the next five years, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Goldman Sachs noted, Alibaba is trading at one of the steepest discounts to net asset value globally among holding companies, and the investment bank expected the restructuring to help close that gap. Well, closing that gap is another 200% up. Uh, in our view. So as we've stated on previous podcast video casts, when the fundamentals don't make sense in the short term or are taking time to catch up, we can look at the technicals to point to our next targets. In the case of Alibaba, we stated 
that the first target from here would be the $160 to $180 range, and it was likely no one, no one would be let in on the way up. Why? Because everyone bought in at $120 after the first 100% move off the fall lows and got flushed back to $80. There will be no belief on the way up this time, and the same chorus will sing, quote, communists, Taiwan, World War III is coming, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. The headlines are designed to separate weak-handed holders from their ownership in the company and transfer it to people like us who gladly scoop it up when others mistake the noise of the day for the fundamental intrinsic normalized earning power and moat of the business. So as we continue to say, borrowed from Michael Burry, quote, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, referring to Xi Jinping. If you invest based on politics, you will always lose. Many Republicans sold their portfolios at the 2009 lows because Obama was elected president. The bull market began and continued to run. Democrats sold their positions after Trump was elected. They missed a monster two-year rally led by tax cuts. Weak-handed Alibaba shareholders puked in the hole in the fall because somehow they thought COVID or wrong-minded policies would last forever. At the end of the day, quality businesses, those with a history of compounding invested capital at rates above their cost of capital and above the market returns, come out of these crises stronger and with more market share than they came in. And that's a key thing. Let me repeat that. Quality businesses, those with a history of compounding invested capital at rates above their cost of capital and above market returns, come out of crises stronger and with more market share than they came in. This time will be no different. It reminds me of the beginning of COVID when a reporter asked then President Trump, quote, but what will happen to all the restaurants, President Trump? To which Trump replied with a straight face, don't worry, honey, they'll still be there. They may have different owners, but they'll still be there. <laughs> the same is true for Alibaba. Weak holders out, strong holders in. Since we've covered the fundamentals many times over, here are our first technical targets, which mean, which are miles away from our final targets. $160 is on the basis of filling a technical gap. $180 is on the basis of a, quote, measured move from the inverse head and shoulders pattern. How useful do I think these technical targets are? Not very, but it gives us something to talk about while time arbitrage ultimately takes us up to fair value. But let's just take a look at the fancy lines for a second here. So this is your inverse head and shoulders. There's a shoulder, shoulder, head. There's the neckline. Uh, if you uh, inverted it, you would see a shoulder, head, shoulder, et cetera, same type pattern. And the measured move is basically from 58 to 121, that's $63. You add that to 121, it takes you up to about 184 and change. Uh, so that's one target. You can see a lot of overhead supply right around that range. And you see this gap here to fill at 160. Uh, and people think these things matter a lot. Sometimes they do, a lot of times they don't. But it's just areas to keep a line, uh, an eye on. I think this overhead supply is probably the most important thing. Why is that uh, useful? Is because, um, uh, let's see if I, I thought I explained that below. That's useful because you're, that's going to be the next spot where the, where the rally is going to stall and people are going to lose faith and it'll check back 20 or 30 points to take out more weak hands that, you know, buy in at 180, get flushed down to 160 or buy in at 160, get flushed down to 140 before the final move up. So uh, this, this analysis is slightly better than useless, but I would pay attention to the short term overhead supply between 160 and 180. This is where everyone will think the move is over because it will stall and pull back for months before making the long term move back to fair value. While technical analysis is a tool, it is not the answer. It is simply a guide to understand where you might be in the process. We find sentiment and positioning slightly more useful. In this case, the technicals are lining up perfectly with a standard emotional process cycle by Justin Mammoth. I think he wrote a book like 40 years ago. We've covered this chart many times in past podcasts, but you can see here with the inverse head and shoulders, you got shoulder, head, shoulder. Well, he just names it differently. Panic is the first shoulder, discouragement is the head. Then you climb up. This is where everyone bought right at anxiety at 120. You can see it here. Then it flipped back. Everyone was aversion, getting all these questions of the week about Alibaba. What do you think now? The same thing I thought before. <laughs> the business is cheap. We want to buy more. That's what we think. Uh, why? Has, has something changed about the business that you know of that the market is not aware of? Please, please uh, identify. No, the price is down. Well, 
I'm not worried about the price. I'm worried about the value. The price will ultimately catch up to the value over time. And now we have a catalyst to move it sooner rather than later, which affects our IRRs, which is the return measured over time, which is actually very important because you can have a triple over 10 years. That's not a really impressive IRR. You have a triple over five years. That's a, that's a, very, that's a very helpful IRR and a, and, a, and a nice contributor. And if you can do it over two to three years, it's even better. So I think this is exactly where we are in the cycle. We've just come off a version at $80 and now we're working our way back up. We'll hit some resistance around uh, 120. That's where people will deny it. And that's when we rip up to this 160 to 180, which is going to be the next area of uh, mental effery, so to speak. So keep in mind that the success of the Alibaba emerging markets trade working is predicated on the weakening of the dollar. We continue to get cooperation on this front. The stock has been cooperating since October when the dollar peaked. Here's when the dollar peaked. That's when uh, Alibaba bottomed. You can see there's no, co you know, there's no accident that those two uh, coincide. And you can see the US dollar broke the trend, tried to retake it and collapsed once again. The same thing with the 10 year yield cooperating. Uh, and Intel is actually, uh, a, which is a position we've initiated and covered in recent weeks. Uh, podcast and video cast is starting to move according to the same pattern, that mammoth pattern, which is, um, you know, panic, discouragement, wall of climbs the wall of worry, checks back aversion, and then starts to work higher. And it looks like this one just broke through denial, um, uh, you know, this week, which is really positive to see. So what do we mean by fair value? I explained it in detail in two different segments on Tuesday. We, you already heard that with Rochelle and Kristen. Uh, this is some behind the scenes. Thanks to the producer, Chris, who took these pictures while I was talking to Kristen during the interview. This is the NYSE. NYSE, this is out front uh, at the NYSE. That's the security booth you walk through. And then you go through this little entrance here with the yellow step. Uh, and that's where you wait for the producer. I always love going back to the New York Stock Exchange because my first ever TV hit was almost four years ago now in 2019, live from the NYSE for Fox Business. Ellie Terrett was the Fox Business producer. She now produces for Charlie Gasparino. And she took a chance on me along with legendary anchor Liz Clayman. I'll always be grateful to them for doing that. And here we are almost uh, four years later, hundreds of hits later. Uh, very, very grateful. But they were the ones that took the risk, and uh, and I'll never forget that. So I joined Liz again on Friday to discuss the banking crisis and one new position idea. Uh, so you you uh, can listen to that here. That was a worthwhile segment with um, our view on the deposits. And then we also talked a little bit of PayPal. So as you can see from the first two segments on Tuesday, what we covered live was different than originally planned in the show notes below, given the historic announcement for Alibaba. So we were originally going to spend a lot of time on sentiment and positioning. But the key theme, which we did get to say, was markets don't top when managers are overweight bonds and cash. They top when everyone is overweight stocks with leverage and there are no marginal buyers left. We're nowhere near this level. And as you can see, we're getting we're either at the pause or they're going to be idiots and do one more 25 basis point hike. But either way, the returns 12 months out on average, 18.9%, 24 months out, 34.7%, and 30 months out, uh, which is uh, two and a half years, is plus 43%. So keep being bearish, but the stats are against you. Um, we went into biotech in detail. You definitely want to check this out and uh, re-listen to the interviews uh, in the beginning. And then a couple more picks, which we didn't get to go into, which was Baxter and Centene. Um, we don't own any Centene yet, but uh, that's one we're looking at because everyone hates it except for the owners, the insiders who uh, the CEO bought 1.9 million 10 days ago. The CFO bought a half a million this month. The COO bought a half a million. Another director bought a half a million. They're writing checks out of their pocket. So that catches our attention, especially when it's trading at nine times earnings, uh, forward earnings versus its historic multiple of 14 times. And you've got business growth. The Medicaid grew 24% last quarter. The uh, Medicare grew 8%. They're a health insurer, and that's what they focus on. This is from Ryan Dietrich, who talks about um, uh, what happens in the final three quarters of the year when the S&P doesn't close beneath the December low close during Q1. And on average, you're up 18.6% for the year or 11.1% for the following three quarters. A uh, similar stat from Bespoke via Carl Quintanilla. Uh, April is the 
best month of the year for returns, followed uh, only December's average gain is stronger than April's, and April's up 61%. 60, 61 over the last 50 years, over the last 100 years, 66% over the last 50 years, and it's up 85% over the last 20 years. And over the last 20 years, actually, April is the best month of the year with a 2.18% gain. The second best is July with a 2.06. If you go back to 100 years, uh, well, let's just do, yeah, if you go back to 100 years, it's second to December. If you go back 50 years, it's still the top. So in the last 50 years, it's always the best month of the year. So you can fight the trend or you can go with the flow. Uh, sentiment is still, you know, retail investors are still petrified. The perfect setup to climb the wall of worry. Only 22.5% bullish, 45% bearish. Unbelievable. Uh, fear and greed, they're still bearish. And the National Association of Active Investment Managers, that comes out later today. We'll get a better read right now. They're at 53%. Uh, utilities earnings, these are defensives. They came down a little bit for this year by 1.1% in the last 60 days, but the stocks have come down a lot. And for next year, they're down half a percent. So they're pretty much flat, even though the stocks are down a lot. Same thing with REITs. REITs are down like 40, 50%. By the way, Vernado is starting to, to rip. And you know our thesis with Vernado, which we own and we've talked about in the last couple of weeks, that's a new position, uh, is look, if they couldn't take Steve Roth out during the great financial crisis, they're not gonna take him out on a stretcher now. Uh, the guy is just too good, and he'll figure out a way. He raised cash into this. Uh, they'll have cash to deploy, uh, and they're building. Speaking of which, two of which, uh, I was in for my interviews this week. One was the uh, Yahoo Finance building on 770 Broadway. The other tenant is Facebook, which I guess that's a question, but um, that seems to be the core place for Facebook in New York, and I think they want to keep talent. But it's again, the, my point that I made last week was, these are the highest quality buildings in New York City. It's just like the malls. Simon Property made it. The B&C malls blew up. The B&C REITs blew up. Vernado is an A REIT in the best cities in the country. Uh, and we think he's going to work his way through this. And, it, and uh, when we're, we expect to be right, that's a double plus. Plus you collect right now, it's a double digit yield. I expect that to get cut in half. And that's when the stock is really going to rally. But maybe it won't. I mean, they already cut the dividend, so maybe we're, we're through that. And now we can just rally and collect a nice dividend that will probably grow over the years. So that's an exciting one in our view with risk and size appropriately. We, we, we're not blind to the risk as well. But <clears throat> um, OK, earnings continue to hold up 248.74 for 2024, despite everyone's pessimism. I thought today was really interesting about the initial jobless claims came in worse than expected but we're in a bad news is good news market because expectations were 196,000 this came in at 198 it's another reason for the fed to just stop it already um uh if spain wasn't enough to to twist their arm <laughs> uh okay let's get some ask me anything questions and then i'm going to get over and watch my kids uh do some swimming here uh first and foremost uh muhammad otayabi any update on asos uh, we said we're not really talking about that one uh, publicly. That's a tiny, tiny position, uh, but we still like it. No change there. Uh, they handled, You said, what about their debt structure? They handled a lot of that earlier this year, and they'll get the rest done. Um, he thinks it's a takeover target. Maybe, maybe not. I, I think it's going to be fine on a standalone basis, uh, and we'll keep an eye on that one. Moving along to... Uh, Tom, how is the recent news regarding, this is from JT Investor, regarding the breakup of BABA, changed your strategy on the position? Uh, no strategy. Got plenty. Glad. Going up. Hold. Uh, nothing more to say there. Uh, Kayla Smith, uh, what are your thoughts on Vonovia stock? It's a German REIT for apartments that's taken a bloodbath. I feel like it can be a multi-bagger because apartments are somewhat inelastic compared to commercial office space. And need for shelter, it has been hammered, believed due to Deutsche Bank scare, inflation, debt. Curious of your take. Uh, let's take a look. I don't know this one. Um, Venovia. Oh, this is interesting. All right, so revenues continue to go up. Property management fee continues to go up. Operating income going up 
operating margins collapsing. Uh, so this is why the stock is down. Negative EBITDA, negative earnings. Negative EBIT. Uh, let's see here. Cash flow statement. Cash from operations is growing. Cash from financing. Net change negative free cash flow. <clears throat> yeah, this for me. I like the thought process. This probably goes in my two hard box. Uh, oh no, yeah. See, the problem with this for me is that number one, there's not enough historic data. I didn't see how they operated through the great financial crisis. Number two is I don't know management, so. There are very few managements in the real estate space that I would feel comfortable betting on because I'm not a real estate expert. Uh, I have um, clients that are rock stars in it and I should probably consult more with them. Um, as a matter of fact, maybe I should do that. Um, but for me, I, you know, this could be a multi-bagger for sure. It could also be BK. You gotta do some balance sheet work. Uh, I, would, I would look for all the bearish information I could find and understand their balance sheet and understand management's history in operating this, but, but for me, it would be a pass. Uh, and that's not to say it won't work, Kayla. I think your thinking is right, but I'm not German, so I don't take country and company risk. This would be both. Uh, so that's that for me is not worth it. There's a lot more ways to make money. Um, and uh, Drew, thanks for the kind note. Let's see, John Clark, uh, what do you make of Baba's low institutional ownership percentage? Does it matter in any substantive way? Number one, you don't know what it is because you're not looking at the Hong Kong shares and that's where most institutions own it. Um, and uh, it does not matter because they'll all come in. Opinion follows trend. As price goes up, they'll all be back. Uh, will an increase be necessary for Alibaba to achieve something close to fair value? No, it, it will come and, uh, and that will be part of the catalyst, but it won't be critical. Um, the key is now that things are happening and moving in the right, all the things that we were hoping for are now, now coming to pass and, um, and part of our original thesis. So with that said, we'll be back next week uh, in a more normal environment uh, and, uh, and probably have a bit longer podcast next week, but I wanna thank you for tuning in. Uh, what a great week, same time, same place next week. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.